Welcome to Uncommon Knowledge. I'm Peter Robinson. Dr. John Taylor holds degrees in economics from Princeton and Stanford. He served as a staff economist on the Council of Economic Advisors under President Ford and as a member of the Council of Economic Advisors under President George H. W. Bush. Under President George W. Bush, he served during the President's first term as the Undersecretary of the Treasury for International Affairs. Dr. Taylor is the author of a number of books, including Global Financial Warriors, The Untold Story of International Finance in the Post-9-11 World, in which he describes his experiences as Under Secretary of the Treasury. John Taylor, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Peter. Segment one, the crisis. Barack Obama, quote, I think everybody knows we're in the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression, close quote. Is the president-elect correct? It is the most unusual crisis, and by some measures, the, the worst, the question. And I, I say financial here because sometimes people equate financial with the whole economy, and, and that's not happened so far. We've had a financial crisis with interest rates rising to unprecedented levels in uh, spreads, that is, the risks that people are experiencing the markets on unprecedented levels. But in terms of the overall economy, we haven't seen anything even close to the experience of the Great Depression, okay. where GDP fell by 20 percent and unemployment into double digits. And I don't think we're going to get there, quite frankly. But okay. on the financial side, quite unusual. All right, let's put the current crisis aside for just a moment. Uh, for a while, we seem to be doing pretty well. Consider a couple sets of statistics. Between 1890 and 1945, the economy contracted seven times, twice by almost 10 percent and twice by almost 15 percent. Contrast that piece of American history with a period from 1983 to 2007 when we have a long, sustained expansion interrupted by only a couple of very shallow, very brief recessions. 83 until effectively, it seems, the day before yesterday, a quarter of a century of sustained right. economic growth. What did we learn that permitted that sustained quarter century of growth to take place? I think the most important thing was to have a, a steady monetary policy that kept the economy from these booms and busts, which it had experienced all during the period that you mentioned. But then during, somewhere in the early 80s, 82 is the time, I say, the beginning of that long 1980s expansion, uh, right through uh, 2007, 25 years, as you say, you had only two mild recessions and long expansion. And you saw inflation low. Remember, that's a monetary right. phenomenon, as Milton Friedman always emphasized. So you kept an enormous amount of stability by having monetary policy focus on low inflation and really making sure it didn't cause booms and busts. Tax policy is less important. Regulatory tax policy is less impor important. Tax policy and regulatory policy more important for the for the growth rate being strong. That is the the progress over time being so dramatic. So you're drawing a distinction between stability, yes, and growth. And your question was that way too, right? Yes, you talked yes, about yes. ups and downs, but absolutely, the stability is more on the monetary policy side of things and the, the steady growth on those low tax rates and and improve regulatory policy. All right, now, here is the question of the hour, and in one way or another, we're just beginning our conversation, but in one way or another, this is the question of, that runs through every segment of this conversation today. Has the current crisis proven that the lessons we thought we learned are invalid? Absolutely not. In fact, to me, they reinforce. <clears throat> this experience reinforces the lessons because because we deviated from those policies that were working well. First, in the 2002-2004-5 uh, period, interest rates were held to unprecedentedly low levels. Uh, that caused excesses. Almost all booms and busts are caused by excesses. So that was not following the policies that I mentioned worked so well for the period you're talking about. Greenspan's Fed was too loose. For a period. No, not, for a period. No, absolutely. For most of the period, the policy, as you indicated, that period was dramatically stable. So it's only towards the end, actually, and that's, that's really why it ended in many respects. Okay. Now, let me quote to you. Alan Greenspan is a friend of yours, I believe. Absolutely. All right. Let me quote to you Alan Greenspan, testifying before Congress this past autumn, quite, quote, the crisis has turned out to be broader than anything I could have imagined. 
Those of us who looked to the self-interest of lending institutions to protect shareholders' equity, including me, Alan Greenspan, are in a state of shocked disbelief. Close quote. Something happened that I, Alan Greenspan, could f never begin to foresee. Are you also in a state of shocked disbelief, John? I'm surprised that it's been as uh, long and as uh, drawn out as it has been and as severe. But I think, again, I told you why it ended, why I think it ended, the good times. I think the p prolonging of the crisis and its increased severity also is due to policy and government much more than to the marketplace. And I would point to an early misdiagnosis of the problem a year ago, uh, and then plus policies which were ad hoc and confused the markets more. We, uh, we'll I we'll get, get back to well, that. Well, yes, I, I, so, I do yeah. want to get to yeah. so, so give me one sentence. <clears throat> I'll read you one sentence, and I want your one sentence answer. French, French President Nicolas Sarkozy, again, this is just this, a couple of months ago. The all-powerful market that is always right, that's finished. Absolutely not. No, again, I think that if you look at this carefully, don't be ideological about it. Don't be political about it. Look at the facts. You see a crisis that was caused, prolonged, and made more severe by government policy, not by failures of markets. All right, segment two. Let's go through... Uh, in some detail, your analysis of what exactly has happened. In the Wall Street Journal on November 25th, you wrote, quote, the economy has pulled, been pulled down by a housing slump, a financial crisis, and a bout of high energy prices. Now, let's take each of those in turn, and you explain to this layman what each of those three items has to do with the crisis we're now experiencing, the housing slump. The s slump in housing followed a boom. Again, that was caused by monetary excesses. But once you have a slump where prices are falling, it makes it much less likely that people are going to be able to keep up their mortgages. It makes it the, the mortgages that were, that were made uh, go into default and delinquency of foreclosure, and that affects the banking system. If a bank is holding those mortgages, it's, its balance sheet is much more risky than it was. All right. So let's zoom out one level. You've mentioned a couple of times now the housing boom is caused by a period when, in your judgment, the Fed was too loose. Monetary excesses, yes. Monetary excesses. What was Alan Greenspan thinking? He was concerned, and, uh, about, and I think for good reason, quite frankly, about possible deflation like they had in Japan. And it was not too long after 9-11 as well. So when you go back now, and someone like me, you're asking me the questions of what went wrong, you've got to recognize policymakers at the time were trying to do what they thought was right. best. And I just say, at this point, looking back, you see there were excesses, and I think that's the reason for both the boom and the bust. All right. And the housing slump is essentially, is a contraction, how do I put this? I'm trying to remember my, what I once understood of monetary policy, monetary theory. You've got prices, velocity, it's a shrinking in velocity of money. People aren't spending as much, isn't that right? Well, the, the bust in the housing came because right. you have a boom, you know, the excesses, prices get so high, they get sort of above what is, would be a natural level based without the excesses, and then they collapse. And by the way, it's not just the United States. We had some similar effects in other countries brought on by similar monetary policies, perhaps influenced by the U.S. Okay, now, um, the Fed is too loose with money. That helps to create the housing boom. The federal government, particularly in the person of Barney Frank, chair, uh, Democrat of Massachusetts, chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, leans on Freddie and Fannie to make loans, in effect to invent the, the market for subprime instruments. He's pushing to get lower income people into homes that we now know in many instances they couldn't afford. That strikes me as the same old story that Milton Friedman would have told. If you see an economic wreck, the government is likely to be involved somewhere. But here's a piece that I'm not so sure fits the puzzle <clears throat> or fits that, that, that narrative. And one other aspect of the crisis is that a lot of very highly paid bankers in New York carried these instruments on their books. And we now know they couldn't value them, that they had no notion what to do if this boom, which everybody understood at the time, I, 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 you could read in every in Fortune and Forbes and Business Week, everybody said this is a housing boom. Everybody knew this couldn't get, or to quote uh, the great Herb Stein, the economist who was the chairman of the right. economic advisors under Nixon, if something can't go on forever, it won't. 
everybody knew this wouldn't go on forever, and yet they were totally unprepared uh, for what would happen when the music stopped, so to speak. And that's not a government failure, that's a market failure, right? Well, you mentioned at the beginning of this, Fannie and Freddie. Yeah. And those were government policies, government-sponsored enterprises. But the government didn't cause Bear Stearns or Lehman to hold too much of this garbage, did it? Uh, obviously, there were mistakes made by people in charge who, who should have known better. And that's, that, and that's not unusual in history, right? Not everybody makes the right decisions. But in terms of your question about government, you do have to add, add Fannie and Freddie to the mix. And also, there were people who tried to pull it back. And I mentioned Alan Greenspan again. He argued they were too big and they needed to be, be pulled back. And you had legislation proposed in 2005 to, to pull them back and, mm -hmm. and, and put them in better control. But it wasn't passed. And so they expanded and added to this, uh, this, these excesses. OK. The, uh, you also mentioned so we, housing slump, financial crisis, and then the bout of high energy prices yes. as a contributing factor. Yes, you remember uh, we had uh, in, in the beginning of the crisis, back in the summer, uh, fall of 2007, mm -hmm. oil prices in the $60, $80 range. Right. Um, but then in, as the crisis began, prices went up to over $140 right. a barrel. Right. I think a lot of that actually can be caused by a very excessive uh, cut in interest rates at that time, which weakened the dollar. With weakened dollar tends to make oil prices high. You lower so interest Ben Bernanke, rates. chairman of the Fed, sees a crisis developing and he pushes liquidity into the markets, lowering interest rates. And how does that affect the price of commodities? Well, first it affects the, the value of the dollar. If you uh -huh. cut interest rates, it makes the dollar less attractive, so the dollar falls. And it fell quite dramatically during that period. And then oil is priced in dollars, so that almost always causes the price of oil to rise. So we think that, I think, that a part of that increase in oil prices was also induced by, I say, a bad di diagnosis of the problem. But, Peter, your main question is why that was a factor in the crisis. Yes, and it's yes. Because obviously very high prices led to very high gasoline prices, which cut into sales of vehicles, which hit the automobile industry and hit Ohio and, and Michigan hard. And so that's, that's so really that was the element. To, to the extent that the financial crisis has spilled over into the real economy, the mechanism was high energy prices. To some and, well, and housing as, okay. as well, of course. All right. Yeah. All right. Multiple choice. The housing slump, the financial crisis, high energy prices, you take them all together, and the crisis of recent months has been A, the result of bad government policy. This is multiple choice. You just get the, the answer that fits the <laughs> okay. best. A, the result of bad government policy. B, the result of market failures, inherent flaws in capitalism, or C, an act of God. That is to say, once a century economic disaster as impossible to predict or to prevent as a hurricane or an earthquake. I think the first uh, part A or whatever you want to call it is a government induced in terms of extending this right. beyond its original part, absolutely. And again, I, I think misdiagnosis of this, as you just described it, the problem in the housing market made risks higher at the financial institutions. A lot of our policymakers address that as a kind of a liquidity problem or people need more money, let's give them a check, let's provide more funds in, a li in liquidity to the banks, let's increase the money supply. And that really wasn't the problem. All right. Segment three, we're from the government and we're here to help. Um, we'll turn in a moment to what you believe the government should do. I want to, next segment will be John Taylor's prescriptions. But first let's talk about what some people who are actually in power seem to think ought to be done. <clears throat> Let's begin with the Federal Reserve. In the last six months, the Federal Reserve has expanded the money supply by more than 11 percent, and in the last three months, by more than 9 percent. You take the expansion of the money supply in the last three months, and it works out to be an annual rate of 37 percent. As best I can tell, that represents the most massive increase in the money supply in American history, and certainly since the establishment of the Fed almost a century ago. Necessary? Sufficient? I don't think it's necessary. I, and I think it's going back to this misdiagnosis that it's not enough, that there is not enough money out there. It's that there's this problem with the banks about not wanting to lend to each other. That's not going to get fixed by creating more money. It's going to be fixed by getting bad assets, these mortgages and derivatives from mortgages off the bank's balance sheets. 
And that's really what should have been done in the first place. Well, then let me add, so, so the expansion of what Bernanke has done, uh, it's not necessary. Is it harmful? I, ultimately, it could be harmful. Let me put it that way. All these things, um, their harm frequently comes in the unintended consequences of them. And one unintended consequence is that there's this money and it eventually creates inflation and makes, you know, gets us in a worse situation right. like we were before these good times in the, in the 80s and 90s that you referred to. There's also the uh, consequences that uh, it will it'll just create uncertainty right. and that uncertainty adds, adds a lot of risks. Government policy, because it's been, I think, too ad hoc has created uncertainty. I'd say markets are, are clamoring for some clarity here about policy. So for example, so, right now everybody knows Bernanke can't keep expanding at this rate, but nobody knows when he'll put on the brakes. That's a very and, big... And when he'll actually bring it, bring it back out, right, actually. Right. Yeah, reverse, reverse the direction. From monetary to fiscal policy, brace yourself for a staggering number. I set out to add up all the numbers associated with the programs that the government has already enacted. I'm not talking about what President-elect Obama wants to do. I'm talking about what the government has already set aside to deal with this crisis. Add it all up. The bailouts of Fannie and Freddie, AIG bailout, the Troubled Asset Relief Program. There are about a dozen of them. And the present number is $5.6 trillion. How does it that is it's a, it's a mind-boggling number. It is number. a mind-boggling It's so number. big people don't really can't get, a, get their arms around it. How does that sit with you? Uh, well, it's, it's a reflection on the fact that there's been so many things. Uh, we, something doesn't work, you try another thing. Something doesn't work, you try another thing. So I think it's a problem. It reflects a problem. Now, to be sure, you know, you're adding a little bit of apples and oranges when you do this because some of the increased um, debt is to used to acquire assets. But the number is so big, it's it doesn't matter. matter. Right. right. All right. Keynes biographer Robert Skidelsky, quote, Kane, this is longish, but again, this is, one of the, this is in the air today. Keynes believed there was only one sure way to get an increase in spending in the face of extreme private sector reluctance to spend. And that was for the government to spend the money itself. Spend on pyramids, spend on hospitals, but spend it must. Keynes purpose was not to destroy capitalism but to save it from itself. The moment has come to build a new structure on the foundations Keynes laid." Close quote. What do you make of that? Well, I don't think it applies to the current situation at all, if it ever applied to any situation. In fact, the, the, the first Keynesian-like response to this crisis was to give people a, a check the economic stimulus package. Of, uh, That's a Keynesian policy. Economic yes. stimulus package, 2008, signed exactly. by President Bush last February. Yes. The last number I saw for that was 162 billion. Yes. And the effect was, so far, nothing. Absolutely. If you look at 115 of that, 165 was basically a rebate check, a check sent to individuals. And the the theory was Keynesian, is that that would make people spend more, and that would. Uh, caused people to get more jobs and kept the economy going. It didn't work. People didn't spend it as, as people s since Keynes, like Milton Friedman, predicted. Well, but what about, John, you mentioned a moment ago that bankers won't lend to each other. People are, people are, are, yes. are sitting on their assets. Yes. Isn't that, Keynes, that, isn't that the Keynesian liquidity trap? There's plenty of money, but nobody, there's no velocity. People aren't spending it. That's, that's not a Keynesian problem? It, the banking problem, since the interest rates have come down close to, to zero, close some to people right. call that as a liquidity trap. But until then, no, it's, it's simply a problem of, of, uh, of credit risk and bad lending and garbage on the made, books. Garbage on the books, yes. Okay. Democratic Congressman Barney Frank of Massachusetts, chairman of the House Financial Services Committee, in a recent interview, I quote, at this point, by, by the way, he is now one of the most powerful figures in America and arguably the most powerful figure in government policy as it concerns finance. <clears throat> At this point, says Barney Frank, there needs to be an immediate, <clears throat> an immediate increase in spending and I think this is a time when deficit fear needs to take second seat. <clears throat> this is a time for a very important dose of Keynesianism. Later on, there should be tax increases. I think there are a lot of very rich people out there whom we can tax at some point down the road and recover some of this money." Close quote. I think it's, it's a mistake. If you raise taxes now or even sort of signal that you're going to raise taxes soon, 
that's a depressant economic activity. How do you create jobs? You create jobs because businesses hire people. If you raise the taxes that he's referring to, you're going to increase taxes on businesses, small businesses. Roughly speaking, 50% of business income will be taxed more under that kind of a policy. So I think it's a mistake to be raising taxes at this point in time. And with respect to uh, you know, big spending programs, we should spend what we need to spend for, for, the, for the growth and the health of our economy and the infrastructure. But to think that that's going to bring us out of this, I think, is a mistake. Right. People, people compare the Eisenhower road building. Well, no one thinks of an Eisenhower road building as something that led to a big boom in the 1950s. Uh, when you say people think of the Eisenhower road building, President-elect Obama explicitly compared his proposal to, the, he called it the largest infrastructure project since the building of the interstate highway system in the 1950s. Let me give you President-elect Obama, quote, investing in an infrastructure program, in roads and bridges, rebuilding our schools, making sure that we're investing in electronic medical records and other technologies that can drive down health care costs. All those things are not only part of an immediate stimulus package, there are also down payments on the kind of long-term sustainable growth that we need, close quote. John Taylor? With respect to the long-term, if, if he thinks that and he works with the Congress and the people, if that's the kind of thing that we need, fine. But it's not going to be the short-term stimulus. We shouldn't fool ourselves. You can't take a road-building project, you get it developed, you have the environmental reports, you have to get the contracts, you get everything in place. So it's not something that's going to help this economy get out of the, of the deep recession we're in right now. All right. Segment four, what should be done. In your article in the Wall Street Journal in late November, you propose four specific measures. Let's just take them in turn. Quote, first, make a commitment passed into law to keep all income tax rates where they are now, effectively making tax rates permanent. Close quote. That would be a powerful stimulus because there is tax increases on the books right now. If you looked at the, at the code, we're going to have taxes increase. The Bush tax cuts are set to expire. Exactly. All over the place. So, and dividends would increase, dividend tax rates, capital gains tax rates. So, a firm commitment not to raise those taxes, I think, would be beneficial to the markets and beneficial to business. Give them more certainty, too, as well, more predictability. Uh, so, that's a very important part of it. Second, I'm quoting you, enact a worker's tax credit equal to 6.2% of wages up to $8,000, as Mr. Obama proposed during the campaign, but make it permanent. Absolutely. Well, again, the permanence is for the same reason, to give people the expectations this is not going to just be a one-time thing. But also, to mention this, it's another example of tax cuts, right, to, to stimulate the economy, making them permanent. But it's also something that, that could be represented as kind of bipartisan. You've got the point one, which is keeping those tax rates constant that uh, Republicans have favored, and you've got this new proposal of of uh, the president-elect, which he favors. So it's a way to move things ahead. Twice now, in your first suggestion and in your second, you use the word permanent. Yes. Why is the permanence so important? Well, two reasons. First of all, if it's something temporary, it won't affect people's behavior. Just like this tax rebate. Remember, we spent $300, $600 a uh, family, and uh, people just pocketed it. They didn't go out and spend, so it didn't jumpstart the economy. But if it was permanent, they say, ha, ah, I got a permanent reduction in my taxes. This is something I can bank on. I'm going to sp they will spend a little my bit more. My income has result. permanently gone up. Yeah, so you can spend more. Uh, plus, if it's the marginal rates, that is, the rates on additional income come down, then you have more incentive to, uh, to, to take a job, and firms have more incentive to hire people. All right. Third, again, quoting, you recognize explicitly that the automatic stabilizers are likely to be as large as 2.5% of GDP this fiscal year, that they will help stabilize the economy, and that they should be viewed as part of the overall fiscal package, even if they do not require legislation. Close quote. What on earth are the automatic this stabilizers? Is, people always ask me that question. Automatic stabilizers, it's a jargon term. It simply reflects the fact that when the economy slows down or goes into a recession, tax receipts to the Sick. government automatically go down. And some of our transfer programs, like Social Security or unemployment benefits, go up. So that increases the deficit. And, 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 is, and that is kind of having tax receipts going down and spending goes up, going up is stimulative. To and that's in the law, and it was going to happen, it and will is happen. happening, it is even happening. Without, without any Hank Paulson exactly. and Ben Bernanke and everybody else running around saying this guy is And it's falling. a big number. You know, it's 2.5% it's, 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 of GDP. What's GDP? 13, 14 trillion? Yeah, so it's going to be over 300 number. billion, yeah. You've All right. Consider that along with so that. So calm down, because those of you who believe in Keynesian stimulus, a little it's, bit is going to take place anyway, yeah. right? Okay. 
Fourth, your fourth and final point, construct a government spending plan <clears throat> that meets long-term objectives, puts the economy on a path to budget balance, and is expedited to the degree possible without causing waste and inefficiency. Close quote. Government spending that's sensible. Yes. Uh, this is maybe the, the hope here, is you don't want to put in some things. You mentioned building pyramids or something like that. Uh, Skidelsky. You, know, you, know, I mean, you don't want to waste money. He's it effectively no saying sense. it doesn't matter what the government spends no, money on. It just needs to spend. That is the wrong philosophy. You do things that you think are needed. The best we can, we have a, a democratic system in our country where we use that to decide on what we're going to do. Rule out, how about ruling out earmarks in this process? Uh, so you have the most sensible thing you can possibly get. Put that in place. And if you can bring some of it forward, fine. But don't think that that's going to make all the difference. The best thing is to have, we know what we need. Do we need more roads? Do we need to fix the roads? Do we need to have an electronic grid? Yes, let's do that. John, you said, you've said several times now, though, that the financial crisis, the credit crisis, is a function of so many institutions having so much garbage on their books, instruments that they can't value properly, and they certainly can't get off their hands. Now, what's wrong? Why, in your four proposals here, didn't you include Hank Paulson's first proposal, which he himself seems to have backed away from now? But this notion that the government is going to inject capital into the banking system by the very specific means of buying up bad paper, get it off their books, just dump it. And this, there's a parallel to the savings and loan crisis, the way Absolutely. we fixed that problem in the 90s. The government took the garbage and then revalued it by auctioning it off over a period of time, an unpanicked period of time. Uh, it's a government intervention. You might be queasy about that, but it addre it's a directly addresses the problem you've identified, it's, right? It addresses a problem caused by government, and it's, we have $700 billion already reserved for that. So This was about mm -hmm. uh, stimulus packages that our okay. people are proposing on top of all that. So I say, yes, of the, of the $700 billion, which is a large sum by any definition, used to be anyway, uh, make sure you, you use that for the problems in the financial system. And uh, the Treasury has said they wanted to use some to get the toxic assets off the balance sheet. They're using some for equity. Uh, they could use some for mortgages directly. But use it the most effective way to address the problem of credit. In so the Hank Paulson system. was making more sense at the beginning of the crisis than he is now. Because he was talking then about having conducting auctions for the yeah. large institutions to get sell this garbage to the government. And now he said they're not going to do that. Well, I think all along he should have said they're going to do several things, the, the three I just mentioned. Uh, he originally said he was just going to do one, and I think that um, misled people. He was politically imprudent, but his, his fundamental... Impulse I think doing, was correct. Doing all of a mixture of all these is really what's appropriate. Yeah. I see. Okay. The Great Forgetting. <laughs> Again, from your November article in the Wall Street Journal, quote, after years of study and debate, economists concluded that discretionary fiscal policy actions such as temporary rebates, and I would insert, and such as most of that $5.6 trillion in spending that's already been here, uh, enacted, um, are not a good policy tool. Now, the phrase that just leapt off the page when I read that, was actually a dependent clause after years of study and debate. Do you have the feeling during this crisis that a lot of hard-won intellectual progress, going all the way back to von Mises and Hayek and Milton Friedman when he was writing the permanent income hypothesis, which I think was published in 50s, so we're talking about at least a half a century, six decades. Do you have the feeling that this... Nobody's refuting it, they're just ignoring it. I do, right? I do have that feeling, absolutely, and I, and I don't know exactly why, but, uh, you know, there's um, fads that come and go. And uh, perhaps the, uh, what fooled people was in 2001, when uh, President Bush started with the permanent tax cut, he also did a ins first installment, if you like, which was a check. And that seemed to help the economy at the time, and so perhaps that started to shift people's thinking a little bit that this could do some good. But I don't have a good explanation, quite frankly. It's, it's, but, but you do no feel question, it. I feel it, absolutely. And the consensus that was there and the consensus that really led to this tremendously um, successful macroeconomic period of 25 years, that's really, it's that consensus, I think, that, that led to the success. And now as we drift away from that, things are not looking as good. John, let me read you a couple of quotations 
You tell me if you think they're still relevant, and if so, how? Friedrich von Hayek, quote, there would be no... <clears throat> there would be no difficulty about efficient control or planning were conditions so simple that a single person or board could effectively survey all the facts. He's addressing here the question of government control of the economy. But the constantly changing conditions of demand and supply can never be fully known by any one center. Under competition and under no other economic order, the price system automatically records all the relevant data. Competition and prices. Makes a lot of sense. Well, it makes a lot of sense. And, and we've learned a lot since then, but that, uh, that basic orientation, I think, is still... What that you is still 100% relevant. Well, the development you, you of high know, technology, of the, of the ability yeah. of to... to uh, I suppose, for example, if you're sitting in the Federal Reserve, you get much better data, much more data, and data much more quickly today than you did when the Fed was created in 1913. It was much more stuff to keep track of, so it's sort of, I don't think it's, even that improvement is not kept up with the greater complexity and how things change so frequently. You know, of course, we have learned a lot about things like externalities, Peter, you know, where there's, there's, a, there's a need for government. This is not LA. There's no role for government by right. any means. But I think that Give philosophy... Give me an example. Well, we have, of course, national defense, and oh, right. is a, we have to, the basic one, providing safety, the rule of law, providing the rules of the game. You know, Hayek also spoke eloquently about the importance of rules of the game, so that the private sector knows what the government is going to do. So the government has the obligation to have rules of what the, what's going on in the markets. All right. Your friend and colleague, Milton Friedman, quote, well, this sounds so simple that it almost sounds simplistic. So we need to remind ourselves in the audience that this is a man who won a Nobel Prize in economics. There was nothing simplistic about this mind. But here goes. Nobody spends somebody else's money as carefully as he spends his own. Nobody uses somebody else's resources as carefully as he uses his own. So if you want efficiency and effectiveness, if you want knowledge to be properly utilized, you have to do it through the means of private property, close quote. Again, still makes a lot of sense. And I think you've seen you know, examples here where, where government has tried to do things better and it hasn't worked out. So, well, again, you don't want to say, and Milton would never say this either, that there's no role uh, no. for government. But so often there's government failure when government comes in. Should the government of the United States be bailing out automakers in Detroit? No, I think that's a mistake. I think the, that is not a hard, that is not a close decision for you. No, it is not actually. Should the government be taking equity positions in banks as it is now? Well, this is a cleanup from a government induced problem. So in this case, I unfortunately have to say we should go ahead and do this and get out as soon as we can. All right. John, do you have the feeling, look, I'm a layman and I see, uh, Nicolas Sarkozy says, ah, the free market, c'est fini. And there's a fellow called the Naked Economist for Yahoo. <laughs> and he said, uh, even as when the Berlin Wall came down, nobody could continue to believe in communism. Now that this crisis has taken place, nobody can continue to believe in unfettered free market. And I get the feeling, now we're talking, you have just laid out your views, but Paul Krugman, is a very eminent economist. Larry Summers is a very eminent economist. And Larry Summers in particular has been saying we've got to spend, spend, spend. We need to jolt the economy with a dose of Keynesian economics. It is very difficult for me as a layman to resist the feeling, yeah. I don't know enough about it, but the feeling that there's a lot more going on here than sheer economic analysis. There are two worldviews, two different views about the structure of economic reality and the correct role of government. Do you I think you're right. I think it is a, a philo philosophical orientation. Uh, Larry Summers also promoted the idea of the f f stimulus package from 2008. He was one of the... Which has laid an egg. Which has not worked. So you have to think, well, people who suggested that, you know, are going to do exactly the same thing or do something modif modified, which is along the same philosophy. But I think... I think you're on, a, on the right track here, but that also <clears throat> suggests that 
economists, people like me, should try to spend as much time as we can showing about the fact, talking about the facts. What happened? What's a reasonable cause? Does the Sarkozy statement make any sense? To me, it doesn't. But I just don't want to say it doesn't make sense. I want to show why. John, give me your best and worst case scenarios for, let us say, three and a half years from now, when President-elect Obama will be deciding whether to run for re-election. Well, the best case and worst case. Well, the case. very best is the, the credit uh, crunch or malaise we're in right now. That jump, we jump back out of that, like we did in nineteen. And that can happen quickly. That'll it's that could possible. Be a, just a I think it's, you asked for the best, Peter. Right. I'd right. say it's a high probability. But that happened in nineteen eighty. Credit controls were put on by the government. GDP fell. They were taken off. GDP rose. This is a different circumstance. You can't just turn it on, turn it off. But that would be the best scenario. That somehow. The problem in the banking and financial sector gets resolved, and, and, and that will bring us back. The worst case is that we're going to have declining GDP all through next year, all through 2009, and, and see a turnaround towards the end of the year or next year, and then a slow recovery. And uh, I hope that doesn't happen, but it's possible. If we raise taxes, it certainly increases that probability. John Taylor of Stanford University and the Hoover Institution, thanks a lot. Thank you, Peter. I'm Peter Robinson for Uncommon Knowledge. Thanks for joining us.